France won, the Republic of Ireland won. France win 2-1 on aggregate and qualify for the World Cup finals. Ireland's World Cup dream has ended amid unbelievable controversy as France have been handed this victory by referee Martin Hansen, who in a terrible mistake failed to spot a handball by Thierry Henry just before William Gallas headed in the French winner. France has scored! Oh no! France has scored, it's one all and the Irish players are furiously protesting as Thierry Henry is celebrating the goal and the Irish player Shay Gibbon is going absolutely ballistic and appears to be chasing up, he's chasing to the linesman now uh, the French players are celebrating out by line, the goal has been giving, it's going to stand and the Irish players can't believe it as far as they can see this is the travesty of justice was... The decision resulted from a free kick 10 minutes into extra time the free was let bounce in the box it was going wide but Henri clearly handled the ball and pushed it back across the box with his hand and Gallas could not miss from a yard out the Irish players understandably went berserk but the referee nor his assistant were for turning and the more you see it the more you realise what a horrendous error he's made God, Gary Henry has controlled the ball basketball style. Thierry Henry has, has caught the ball and balanced it against his hip and then dropped it and crossed it and it's been headed into the net by Flora Maluna but it's a scandal. It never should have been a goal. It was as bad a decision as you'll see at this level. An absolute disgrace and a terrible way to end the match that will go down as a classic. The Irish players were understandably shattered at the final whistle. Their chance to play at the greatest show on earth has been cruelly taken away from them but they will leave Paris with their heads held high. It finished after an epic night at the Stade de France. France won, the Republic of Ireland won. France qualified for the World Cup, 2-1 in aggregate. Well, there we are, 18th of November 2009, 10 years ago, a World Cup in South Africa snatched away by the grubby but admittedly deft left hand of Thierry. We'll never forgive you, Henri. Roy Keane told us to get over it, and he's right. But for the next 40 minutes or so, we won't get over it, Roy. We're digging deep into memory lane. We'll dig deep into memory lane. We'll dig deep into the archives. Shay Gibbons is going to take a call. Kevin Kilban on the shoulder of William Gallas that night will also join us. And Nathan Murphy, who you heard there, a young, enthusiastic Nathan Murphy, is alongside me now. Ten years on. Beaten down. The voice an octave deeper, I would say. Several. <laughs> Several. Worn out. Yeah. Frustration. God, it's weird listening back. It's been weird watching it back. I watched the game back last night and there's so many parts and... I think that there was a classic. It was a, such an unbelievably good Irish performance and just the anger, the sheer anger amongst every Irish person, players, supporters, journalists. Ken Early. Ken Early. Ken was particularly angry. You sounded less angry, but I know you felt it deep down. Well, Ken was actually <laughs> reporting live. Yes. Mine was on the full-time whistle. The horror was unfolding in front of Ken's eyes. Mm. You had a bit more time to digest. Well, I think, as you probably heard from Ken, initially... And I know you were in the stadium. Initially, I don't think anybody realised that Thierry Henry had handled the ball. There was a feeling that it was an offside. It all happened so quick that certainly the angle I was standing and sitting at, and an awful lot of people didn't have monitors in front of them, that it looked as though he maybe just sort of slightly, as you often see, led a little bit with his arm and controlled it back in. Mm. It w and the impression was that the players were appealing for an offside. It was only the second you saw the handball and just how blatant the handball it was that the anger levels rose considerably very quickly. It's interesting you say that because obviously you would have had a very different angle. I was sitting high up in the stadium. My brother, as smart, intelligent, high achieving type that he was, was in college over in Paris, as you do. Mm. And I said, well, I'll go over. I was working on the Right Hook show at that stage in 2009. I'll sleep on your floor in your uh, dorm room. We'll go to the match together. Grand, perfect, done. So we were high up not really with Irish fans, I don't know how we got our tickets, can't remember. And I was, so we were, if you can imagine, we were above the linesman. Right. The linesman was on the far side of the pitch to Henri, Henri handled the ball, at, you know, when you were watching on TV, Henri handled the ball near post, linesman was kind of far post. So we were above the linesman. So straight away I saw the handball as clear as day. I had the perfect view. I had the view the linesman had, right. but without the bodies in the way because I was looking down on it. And I turned to my brother, eruptions around us, I said, you saw what happened there, did you? And he said, no. I said, Henri handled the ball there. And he sort of looked at me a little bit like, I understand fans see things the way they want to see things. And he said, yeah, 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 sure. And I said, no, he really, like, wait until you see this when we get, you don't understand. So walking into the stadium without a monitor and obviously without smartphones, I fully appreciated what had happened. And then we got back to his dorm room, saw the pictures, and he was like, oh. Mm. And then all hell broke loose. 
Well, exactly. I think you're right. All hell broke loose. And maybe his reaction, I think, was the reaction of a lot of the supporters and everybody in the ground, which is when it came to covering the Ireland team, mm -hmm. we sort of constantly looked at it in a negative way and we presumed the worst. Mm. So the initial reaction was bad defending, bloody typical. Yeah. Bloody typical. A Paul set Mc piece. Paul McShane. McShane comes on, something horrible happens. Bloody typical. Mm -hmm. Where was Kilban? Was he tracking back? Didn't happen. Yet again, we've blown it to, oh, wait a second. Actually, mm. we did everything right here. And we played bloody well. Robbie Keane with that brilliant goal in 33 mm. minutes. The team, if you want your memory jog, Shea giving a goal, John O'Shea right back. It was Richard Dunn and Sean St. Ledger in the centre of defence. It was a young book by the name of Kilban. Phoning it in at left back. We had Liam Lawrence, who was in the form of his life then, actually, and played well that evening. Liam Lawrence on the right wing. Glenn Whelan and Keith Andrews. Keith Andrews, can I take a moment? was exceptional. Mm. Man of the match by a distance. Exceptional. Damien Duff, Robbie Keane and Kevin Doyle, who obviously was in very good form then. So that was the Irish team. You were there for Today FM. I was. A fine establishment. Yes. And you were down in the tunnel with John O'Shea, Robbie Keane and some bloke called Caban. Yeah, got wrenching. Um, we thoroughly deserved to go through in the 90. And then you hope, uh, well, I think the linesman and the ref had two chances to get a, to get a decision right. Obviously, um, it's obviously hard to take. Look, we should have, we should have gone through in the 90. We've, we've, we've played fantastic stuff and um, got wrenching to go out as we did with such a, such a clear handball. Absolutely top player and he has been for, for a long time. And, um, it was a clear handball. He actually dragged it in from from going out, so uh, he actually nearly caught her and and brought her back. So uh, you wouldn't expect it's a bit it's, it's a bit of a killer. I think you know yourself. It's it's outrageous, really, isn't it? I think um, I saw it clearly. We should have won the game. We, we were dominant throughout the match, and uh, we we probably created enough chances to win two or three games tonight. And it's so disappointing the way that it's ended for us tonight. You know it's bad when Kilban says it's outrageous. This is true, this is true. So that was you in the tunnel. I, with your general memory of the tunnel, everybody grimmed out massively, I, I would think. Just absolute pandemonium, because Thierry Henry, as I remember, walked through the mix zone at one stage and stopped and spoke to quite a few of the French journalists and just seemed as he was throughout a little bit. Yeah, it happened, that's football. <clears throat> Maybe I shouldn't have done it, but I'm certainly not gonna lose any sleep over this. And as angry as I've ever seen professional footballers from an awful lot of the Irish players and is emotional because the one thing I think that often surprises and the one thing you learn when you start covering mixed zones is players can take defeats very well. They certainly take them far better than supporters and it would probably upset supporters if they see how relaxed players quite often are because they know there's another match. There was no other match for this. For all these players, for an awful lot of them, it was their one and only chance to play the World Cup and they never got to play the World Cup, an awful lot of those players and I think they knew it that night. Shay Given did get to play the World Cup, obviously, in 02, but I'm sure he would have loved another one. You're there, Shay? Hi, guys. You OK? Yeah. How angry do you remember feeling, or was it more sadness afterwards? Yeah, I suppose at the time it was a bit of both, really. Anger, and then I suppose as the years go by, then it's more sadness, I suppose, but it's something you have to live with you. Like, you know, you'll never forget it. We're talking about 10 years now, but 20 years, 30 years, you'll still remember it. So, yeah, it was a tough one for, for the players and, of course, the fans back in, back in Ireland as well. I mean, I don't know what they were thinking. They could see probably better shots than, than the players and the replays and what have you straight away. They could tell that, that it was an injustice and we felt robbed in the night. It was a dirty ball into the box. I mean, it was a tricky one and you would have been within your rights to think, well, Paul McShane, this is going to land in his vicinity and he's going to clear it and I'm just going to stay put because the worst thing I could do is come out and take both of us out of the game. But then I'm sure over the years you might have thought to yourself, could I have come and punched it? But then, like I said, you would have been within your rights to think it was McShane's ball. What's your memory of that mm. moment, that split-second decision you have to make so often as a keeper? Yeah, yeah, looking back, I've, I've, no, I've no qualms with my decision. You know, you make, I suppose, thousands of decisions in your career and, and looking back, I wouldn't have changed the decision I made. You know, the decision was that it was going to get cleared before that and you had punched and then, you know, the, the, the laws of, of, of Henri running in, the ball was going to go clear out of play and it was going to be a goal kick. There was no... I wouldn't have changed my mind what I did. I wouldn't change it looking back either. You know, that I made the right decision. And, and you know, the handball, he, he stopped it with his forearm. He sort of 
semi sort of stopped up the way he's for him and then pulled it in with his hand as well. It was a double handball and, you know, I, I was so blatant. I was I was just grabbing the ball to take a free kick because, you know, I was, you know, the ref obviously seen it, the linesman, whatever. It was just a, it was so blatant. It was like, yeah, it's a free kick. And I was, I was shocked when I looked at the referee and he pointed to the halfway line and I looked across the linesman. He's running towards the halfway line. I think, oh, this is, this is a, like a bad dream or something. This is actually really happening. So it's probably the quickest you've ever seen me move in my career was, was sprinting after the referee to, to say that this is, you've clearly got this wrong. You know, mm. speak to your linesman, do something because this is, this is an injustice. This is, this is totally wrong. They say your hamstrings never recovered from that night, actually. <laughs> no, never, never. <laughs> Did any? I mean, uh, honestly, it was just it was just surreal that that, that it could be given. You know, um, I don't have a lot of you know bad 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 blood for Henri. I think it was, it was such a blatant thing wrong by the referee, or even if he had a bad angle and the, the linesman was looking right across the line, he could see that you know Henri's arm was stuck out, his arm was stuck out, and, and of course it was a double hand ball and and. You know, just so blatant. As I say, I was the closest to it. Probably at the time, it was so blatant. It was, it was an obvious free kick for ourselves. Do you see it as cheating? Um, oh, cheating is a strong word at times. I mean, the, I don't recall too many other players who handballed the ball in a box and, and maybe it's led to a goal that has gone to the referee and said, "Oh, by the way, you got that wrong. I actually handballed it." I remember the, uh, I think Robbie Fowler back in the day. I think he went past David Seaman and he jumped up in the air and the ref gave a penalty and he went to the referee and said, "No, he didn't touch me. It should have been." It should be a free out, if anything, and, and the ref stuck with his decision. But I don't remember too many other strikers or attacking players that would go to a referee after and say, Do you know what, actually handballed that. That, that, should be, that should be a free to Ireland. That should be a free out. That was, that was wrong by me to do that. I think, um, I don't know, cheating is a strong word, and I feel that the, ref, the referee or his officials that night got it totally wrong. It's important, Shed, that you never forget what happened after that Robbie Fowler incident, whereby he missed the penalty on purpose and Jason McAteer mm -hmm. smashed in the rebound. <laughs> I can always trust Jason McAteer to, to do something uh, he wasn't supposed to but yeah I mean that's, I mean, there's probably maybe other people listening would, 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 would remember other occasions as well but you know people probably in Ireland have a lot of uh, you know say bad blood towards Henry for, for what he did but at the same time I feel it, it was more the officials got it wrong and I don't recall too many other people who maybe have done something that they shouldn't have done on a football pitch and, and, and gone to officials and says actually you know I thought I wronged you there, you know, that's the wrong decision. You may kind of change your mind. And I don't remember too many officials changing their mind either when they did get it wrong as well. Mm. You know when you run over to the linesman and get involved with the referee, I don't know, do they mm. speak English? Do they respond to you? I mean, does the linesman even say to you, look, I'm really sorry, I didn't see it. I can see by everyone's reaction something's probably happened here, but I just didn't see it. Or is it stern faces, get away from me? Um, I, I think in that, that, that situation, I think they, they feel that they, they've got it right. You know, I think... You know, maybe part of them must be thinking, you know, the, the reaction for me personally, as much as anyone, because I was the closest to it, then, you know, did we get this right? You know, because, you know, if it's a 50-50, it's kind of like, you know, you hold your hand up in the air maybe and, and, and it gives the goal and you go, okay, that's happened. But, you know, I think after my reaction and a few other players who were close to the incident was kind of like, oh, yeah, we must have messed up here. Something must have happened. You know, even speak to the fourth official, did you see anything? I don't know, do anything. But it was just, they made the decision, made the wrong one clearly. And there was no, there was no change in their mind. So there was no changing their mind. When you went back into the dressing room afterwards and when you're flying home that night and there's a growing awareness of just how great an injustice this has been and obviously it was to grow in the days following that, did any part of you ever think that there was going to be some way back, that something would happen, that they'd be forced to replay the game, that there would be the 33rd team? Did, did any part of you ever think, you know what, this was such a grave injustice, something is going to have to happen? Well, we kind of hoped. We you know, hoped and maybe prayed and whatever else if they think that, you know, maybe we could get a replay. Maybe there'd be some sort of, you know, someone at FIFA that might say, you know, this this was clearly wrong. And, and you know, I've got friends in America, I've got friends in South Africa. This was war. This news was this, this this sort of injustice, whatever you want to call it, was it wasn't just big news in Ireland. It was big news everywhere in the world. Everyone says surely these France can't go to the World Cup on the back of this. This this doesn't seem right. So the more it was kind of the story was gathering momentum all around the world, not just in Ireland, but all around the world. That, that maybe as players we felt, you know, maybe, maybe something somebody might step in and go. Worst case, you know, this this player even 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 some of the French people, some of the French public, you know, people I know from from France are saying, you know, that it's probably the best thing to do would have been maybe play the game again, and 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 that would have been fair because if you can remember back as well, France went to the World Cup and. You know, they had a disaster. It was as if, it was as if like getting there was, was an injustice, and then and everything sort of went kind of pear shaped for them while they were there as well. I remember the coach 
like a fitness coach or something at the time, chucking his whistle over a head at one point. That, you know, they all fell out with each other and they had a pretty poor World Cup. And, and yeah, I don't know if it's karma or whatever, but it was, a, it was you know, maybe maybe some sort of injustice that, that they were there in the first place. Just for one very last point, Shay. The other thing about that night is how well Ireland played and the type of football and there was a real attacking verve to the whole thing and Keane's goal brilliantly taken and a great move and all that stuff. One of the kind of stories after that game was that there was a sense from the senior players some have said at the back of a bus on one occasion or at some point in the build of the game, senior players got together and said, look, we love Travatoni and, and it's all very well, but we actually need to go for this game and we're going to throw the shackles off to an extent. Did that happen? Has mm. that been overblown? Is it just the way the game went? What's your memory of that side of things? I think probably it was, it was a little bit of a little bit of everything because it's the first leg in Dublin, you know, obviously the, the high-pressure situation is the playoff for the World Cup Finals and and maybe a little bit in Dublin, I don't know if it was nerves or, you know, we, we felt that we didn't play at our maximum or we didn't play the best we could play or we felt that the first leg, maybe we, we built it up too much. The pressure not got to us, but we just didn't express ourselves as, as we knew we could. We, we we didn't feel that that was the Irish team that represented us that well on the night. We just, for whatever reason, we all didn't play collectively that well and we just felt in the second leg is you know, a bit of a, a bit of a thing, maybe even the huddle before the game or even on the bus leading up to the game, it was like, okay, yeah, strap ponies give us the game plan and all that. But we were like, you know, we have to take the shackles off of it and we have to really go for it. And and, and for me, playing for Ireland for, for a long number of years and many caps was was one of the best performances that night, you know, that I, I can remember in an Irish shirt and, and to go to Paris and, and to get a performance like that. And as I say, it was one of the best that I played in, in a team. You know, everyone played you know, right to, to their maximum. And, and we played really, really well. And then mm. to lose out in that way was just, as I say, an injustice. We felt we felt robbed. And, and um, you know, that'll never change. And, and it doesn't, 10 years on, it doesn't make it any easier. And you can catch them in another 10 years, hopefully, if it's still on this planet. And it, it, it'll still be as, as raw. And I can remember it, you know, as if it was yesterday. And, and, it, and it's difficult to take. Well, I think I speak for all of us when I say I hope we're not doing the 20-year anniversary in 10 years' time. <laughs> uh, Shay, thanks so much for talking to us. Appreciate it. All right. Cheers, guys. So while you were in the tunnel with the players, Nathan Murphy, mm. trying to make sense of it, back in Donnybrook, back in Donnybrook in real time, we had Bill, what a time, Bill and John and Eamon and Graeme Soonis trying to make sense, digesting the horror in replay after replay as to what had happened. Uh, well, there's a few things in it, Bill. I think if we see it again, I think they were offside when, it was, when the ball was kicked. You can see the players there, there's a line will come across it. And I think the, there's a couple of blue shorts definitely onside. Offside. Offside, sorry. McShane did nothing, but definitely a blatant double handball by Henri. Handles it there, and then he handles it again. He actually controls it with his hand, he touches it first. Now, I think the, the, the linesman probably from the other side, could, there were so many bodies around there that he, he couldn't see it, he couldn't actually see it. But why could he not see it, John? It's very obvious there's nobody in his way. I think there's bodies between him and there. That's, that's what I feel, Bill. You know, but definitely... would you not know, John, from the direction of the ball, the, the change of direction of the ball, that something like a handball happened? No, you, you might not, Bill. Not from that distance. See, it happens very quickly. We're seeing so it in slow light. motion. I mean, he almost catches it. He does, yeah. He does. does. Lightning <laughs> quick as well. It's happened in a flash. quick, Bill, you know. And if you don't get a good view, view of it, uh, but, but again, Eamon made a sort of video evidence. There's a compelling argument oh, for video. No, look, there's too there's much no doubt about video evidence, Bill. Yeah. I, don't know how, I don't know why they haven't brought it in I mean, that's a now. mistake that cost the FAI millions and millions. It, it did. did, but more importantly, the Irish fans, both who went to Paris who were at home, uh, the Irish players, who's the biggest night of their international career and the biggest opportunity, the last opportunity. So much is at stake tonight. And if you see rugby union, if you see tennis, yeah. if you see cricket, cricket all the sports where these disputes can happen, our video referee is now, and one pick for each coach during a yeah, game should be right, Shay, It's common it. sense. It is, of course. All I anger's directed there at Thierry Henry. But Dunn's fouled slightly. You should get ahead Let's on Let's have that. a look at it again and tell us if what you, you, you mean. It's a floated ball <clears> in, and, and Dunn's been winning them all night long. That one is fouled slightly. And then McShane must realise when that ball's put down before it's kicked, who he's marking, he must he must know in that point, at that point in there, he must know on reason outside of him. He must. And then he's so, so in other words, you're saying McShane as much yeah, as I'm the saying, handball oh, is yeah, responsible. I'm saying, I'm, saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying if you accept that Thierry Henry's cheated to get the goal. It's happened in a flash. We've all been in that position. But then as a coach you'd be saying, well, why didn't we deal with it better? And I think that Dunn had been winning everything all night. That's arguably the first one he's not got his head on. 
Mm. But I do think that he's got a slight argument because I think he's pulled as he attempts to jump by number 17 there. Yes, yeah. yeah. He's, he, in saying that, he's got the wrong side of him. And then McShane just, he knocks off. Now, you can say he's come on as a sub and maybe he wasn't fully... Well, it, well, it, he he did reasonably half well up to then, to be yeah. fair to him, didn't he? McShane is always an accident waiting to happen, Bill. Mm. So, um, he, he has been. Uh, he's playing for Hull. He's a poor player. Well, I, and, he, and he's not the only fullback we've got. You know, we've got Stephen yeah. Kelly. And we've got can Steve I, can I interrupt you a second? Yeah. Let's, let, I think we should look at the Irish chances and then go back to yeah. the whole question of the bench. And on and on it went. You're an accent waiting to have <laughs> A beautiful madness. <laughs> you listen to that, and that, that is the panel at its best. There has just been the greatest robbery ever seen in sport. Shane should have got his head in it, though. Really? Really? The other thing... He that, should have. That he he yeah, should have. Having looked but, at it again recently again, I mean, really. And but, we asked Shea. Shea was within his rights to think McShane has this. But... Mm -hmm. The ball was going out of play if Thierry Henry hadn't handled it. It was. Not that McShane left it for those reasons. He just no. got himself in an awkward position. It's worth remembering, though it's only a decade ago, it was such a totally different era. You mentioned your brother going back to the apartment and watching this. So, I think I just got my first smartphone. Twitter wasn't really a thing. No. When you went to the game, you actually watched the game. I remember I'd always ring my dad after a game and go, what happened? And you'd say, what are the panel saying? What happened? when you'd be heading down to the mix zone. Yeah. So you'd kind of have a better idea of what to ask the players. So for an awful lot of people, and I do remember leaving the ground, meeting Irish supporters, and I'm like, was it a, was it a handball by Henri? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I, because if you didn't see it, you'd be sceptical that you're letting your bias mm. kick in here. Like, like, no, no, he, yeah. as everyone obviously knows exactly what happened. But yeah. I think an awful lot of people, directly as they walked out of the stadium, thought, bloody Paul McShane. Mm. So the next afternoon, this was a glorious time when every time the Ipswich 10 manager was doing a press conference, Sky Sports would send someone along and ask him about the issues of the day. And so, needless to say, this was the issue of the day, and here was the Ipswich 10 manager. Ireland had the chances in the two games. They never took it in the first game, they never performed. Um, I heard a few interviews after the games where the manager was speaking about none of the players got booked. Maybe that was a problem, they should have got booked in the first game because we stood off France. In the second half, we had opportunities to score, and we didn't take it. But usual Irish FBI re, you know, reaction, we've been robbed, the honesty of the game. It was one of the group matches, I'm sure it was Georgia, where Ireland got a penalty. It was one of the worst decisions I've ever seen from one of their defenders, which changed the whole course of the game. I think, I think Robbie scored the penalty, and Ireland went on to win it. I don't remember the FBI after the game saying we should give him a replay. John Delaney, he's on about the honesty. And I wouldn't take any notice of that man. Really? No. So people people, people forget the last time I were in the World Cup, 2002. Yeah. People seem to forget what was going on in that World Cup. And that man's on about honesty. I was one of the players, he didn't, he didn't have the courtesy to ring me. He got interviewed and all he said was, I don't know where he is, he's on the island. He's on the island somewhere, I think. I've been involved in Ireland since I was 15 years of age. <laughs> well, I mean, it didn't take long to get back from where we were to that. Hey, Kevin Clavan, what about that penalty against Georgia? You don't moan about that so much. I don't even remember it, what happened? It was the worst decision Roy Keane had ever seen. <laughs> so, uh, it actually was. It was a shocker. Was it? Looking back at the goal, uh, it's very, very obvious Shea Given sees what's happening. Uh, and you are just, um, well, look, I don't want to say you're the wrong side of William Gallus, but you're just behind William Gallus. And yeah. you, you instantly see what's no, happening. Stop. And no, your, your, your hand stop. goes into the air even before Gallas gets his head to the ball. So you saw the whole thing in real time perfectly. Yeah, I stopped. I stopped because, yeah. It, it, I, I, I think I'd said it immediately afterwards. I think you, you have to just carry on, don't you? But I stopped because it was that blatant and it looked that blatant to me. So my immediate reaction was to stop, turn to, turn to the referee. I think that's what I did. And in doing that, I, in stopping, William Gallas got in front of me. Yeah, and that was that was the, the problem. So, yeah, of course, I, I contributed to that goal as well. But it was that blatant when it happened. It was It just happened so quickly. And... I don't know. You look back at it now and it just it, it actually still seems so fresh in your mind with everything that happened. There aren't too many things that would have happened maybe across the course of my career when things just seem so fresh in your head and you can actually remember where you were, remember where you were in, in that penalty area, in the little moments leading up to it. But that would be would be right up there with any any moment in my career that I could clearly remember, yeah. Shay Gibbon was just on and he said he was almost reaching for the ball for the free kick out. How quickly yeah. did you realise like the noise in the stadium happens and you're suddenly trying to scream, everyone's trying to scream. How quickly did you realise actually this goal is going to stand? Well, 
yeah, quick enough, I suppose. I, I, I mean, my immediate reaction was because I, I looked to my right then when it happened, and I might immediate reaction was to look for, for the assistant who was on the. I was in the left back position at the time, so he would have been on my side. So I looked immediately over to him, and my immediate reaction then was to run. I think Shea then came over with me as well. That's where we went. That's where we headed because we thought that he had a clear a clear view of it because obviously Henri was at, was ahead of uh, of our defence and the how blatant it was obviously off his off his forearm first and then the little drag back with the other with, with his hand so that was my immediate reaction so I, I clearly I quickly knew and I clearly knew what had happened mm. and then you go and talk to the officials and you're getting you no know, it's a goal and that's it and uh, it was yeah it, it was it was <laughs> It was, I don't know. Disbelief, I, I, it, I'd say. It, disbelief. It was disbelief. Yeah. You can't even, you can't even like process that, process that now, really, so long down the, that down the road in, in how that actual decision was, was missed. The linesman has since said that Kevin Cavan blocked his view, so it's actually, it's actually doubly your fault. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Did he say that? Did he say yeah, it was three, on the record. Yeah, yeah, Kev was in the way. If Kev had tracked Gallas, I would have seen it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you've got a point, Joe. You've got a point. <laughs> Shea brought up the Robbie Fowler incident uh, when he dived against David Seaman and how he brought it to referees' attention. Did any part of you think that this is so blatant and obvious that Henri's going to hold his hands up and go, you know what, you know what, ref, I really shouldn't have done that? Mm. It's a great. It, it, I mean, it's a great point, I, and, I, and I think we all know what happened in the aftermath when he he went and sat alongside Dunny and and everything like this because obviously the, the guilt was getting the better of him, and it wasn't until we probably watched it back. To, you know, you you, you, can't, you almost need clarity in your head. You, you know it's happened. You know it's handball. And mm. I went and spoke to the referee at half time of extra time, and I just said to him, I said, look, that was handball. He said, look, he, and he and I've said it before, and I spoke to you guys, one hundred percent, that was not handball. One hundred percent, it wasn't. And I actually said to him, that's, that's the worst, that's the biggest decision and the worst decision you've made and you, you'll ever make in your career. And so you, you can't. You just have to get on with it. And that was what it was. We were obviously chasing the game at that stage, so. We were trying to be focused on getting ourselves back into the game. So everything else, no, I, I don't think, I thought like Henri's going to hold his hand up. I never thought that. Mm. It was only when I watched it back and I actually saw the way that he celebrated behind the goal. That's what pissed me off more than anything else because he was giving it the nice guy act sat beside Dunny. Yeah. And when we got to the changing room, we saw the way that, that he celebrated that moment. And that was the thing that actually, look, don't, drop the nice guy act now. That yeah. was the thing that, that, that pissed me off more than anything else, I well, think. Well, Kev, yeah. Kev, that was actually the next question. You mentioned the dressing room. So, you know, we, we just played earlier on Nathan talking to you in the tunnel and to John O'Shea. And did to I, was that, what did I say? You said it was a disgrace, I think. In a very nice way, but you said it was a disgraceful yeah. decision, yeah. You said this guy's going to go far in his career. Yeah. <laughs> but um, can you, do you have any memories from the dressing room? So I pres you mentioned they're watching it back on the TV. So presumably there's a, ca there's a television in the dressing room, uh, were people ranting? Were people kind of sitting there in shell, shocked silence? What, what's your your memory of the dressing room, if you have any? Who, who was, who yeah, was ranting? It, it, yeah, it, in the aftermath, silence, immediately in the dressing room. And then we kind of huddled around Brian McCarthy, who was our video analyst at the time. So we huddled around Brian just to get a clearer view. Then, when everyone saw it again, the boots were being launched across the dressing rooms. That's when the anger set in. It wasn't until we'd actually watched it back because the disappointment was immediately straight after the game. It was the anger that set in after that. I mean, I remember Giovanni Trapattoni. He was he was he was got it was as irate as I'd ever seen him because he was always calm. You know, he never he never said a word to us in the lead up to a game like pre match in the game. He never said one word to the team at half time. He didn't talk to us at all. He never said a word to us at half time. In the aftermath of the game, usually at full time, he, there might be one or two words that he would have said, but very little. He, he spoke very little on a match day. But that that moment, uh, he, Tardelli, and Liam Brady, they were, we, and Damien, and whoever it was, you, you name the lads. We we were. It was the anger had set in then, and you know you can imagine the language in the dressing room. And obviously, then when we walked out to Nathan at that stage, you got Nathan would have got various uh, interviews and various lads with different sort of responses to what they were saying, but. The anger set in fairly quickly once once that initial uh, look at the at the goal had, had been seen by all, yeah. I don't suppose Thierry Henry or anybody from the French team poked their head around the dressing room door. Not at they? all. And not at all. And, and that's what made it yeah, and, and you know what? I, I mean, serious now, I remember playing when we I, I played in the in the Wigan game when we relegated Sheffield United and you know, it, it, it was heartbreaking for them at Bramall Lane. And I remember 
myself and two or three other lads, and not, not saying it for sure or anything, but we went in and we spoke because we knew what it meant to them. None of that. No chance. And and that's when I go back to my point that once I'd seen the way that he'd celebrated, that didn't that didn't click in my mind because you, you're immediately running to the officials and you you know what's happened. Once we seen once I'd seen the way he'd celebrated and maybe the the well maybe what I would consider, I suppose many others would consider a, a bit of an act around it afterwards about, you know, how how contrite he was and how and how he wanted to try and make things uh, amend and uh, you know you know all that sort of rubbish. Mm. I, I understand. I get the fact as it happened. I never would have ever thought in a million years we we're ever going to get a replay. But it was just how that reaction that was that that maybe said it all in a nutshell. Exactly what sort of character he was. That's that's the way that I thought immediately. I'm not, I'm not saying you know he's a bad guy or anything like that. But what that that immediate moment just hit home to me. I'm thinking. Come on, mate. Come on. You know exactly what you've done there. You've you've cheated us all, and that's that's what maybe struck me immediately straight after the game. Once once I'd watched it back. What did you do after the game? Was it fly straight back home and then move on with your lives, or did you come together, speak to the FAI about possibilities of replays, about what could happen next? No, you you kind of know what happened, Nathan. So you're asking me a leading question there, aren't you? Um, we you know we we went back as a team. And we 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 just went. We, we had a few drinks. That was basically it. We we were up in. We went up near the airport to a, a small bar in Swords. And by the time we got back into Dublin, I'd say it was about two three o'clock. And we just went out had a few drinks. We 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 all stayed up. We did not. None of us slept. We got up in the morning. We had breakfast together in this same bar, and we were just together really. So no, we never had any discussions with the FEI. We'd, we'd seen across the course of the day various interviews that had gone out. You know, one or two of the lads had taken phone calls. I think I took a call that day as well for, for, for radio uh, in the morning or certainly late on that night that was kind of being played out. And that was pretty much it, really. We just got on, we just got on through that day together. Um, and then we made our way back to our clubs that following day. And that, that's all that we could have done, really. There was nothing else to be done. Yeah. There was no dialogue with the FBI. They weren't able to to put across anything to us, their views. They weren't able to, to try to tell us what they were doing in terms of negotiating, if there was any, any any negotiations going on, which it was just about, I don't know, it was just about maybe just trying to get back to, to your clubs then, really. It was done, it was gone. The 120 mm. minutes had, had been had finished and it was never going to be reversed, was it? The, the game was no. never, ever going to be replayed, let's be honest. No, it wasn't. Not with, not with France and Ireland. And yeah, Shea... but, that was, that, but that was a general consensus, yeah. though, John. No one ever, ever thought that that was ever going to happen. Shea was on and we, we, we touched on just how good the football was that night as well, which is always worth noting because it was a, a brilliant performance. Yeah. I guess the really sad thing is, and look, I know you have a healthy perspective in life and it's not the end of the world and nobody died, but these are very rare opportunities and to play the World yeah. Cup is a special thing. We know what playing for Ireland means to you. And the sad thing for that mm. team and to an extent Trapattoni is that two years later, and I know, you know your back gave up and you see so you didn't actually make the Euros, but two years later... That team is just that two years older and it wasn't. It didn't help those two years. They would have been in a far yeah. better place going to that World Cup in 2010 with a manager maybe they were less fatigued by. You know, I mean, Trapattoni mm -hmm. probably had a, a sell-by date with any group. So that's probably the, the real sadness, the real pity that you didn't get to that World Cup, which one is a blow, and two, you could have gone there in, in finer fettle and maybe done something, you know, and, and who knows? Yeah, I know, I, I, I agree with that. I do agree with that. I, all I all I wanted to do as a kid, and I said it to you many times, was sure. play for Ireland in a World Cup. That was the only thing I wanted. Unfortunately, I, I did uh, get to do that. But once you've had that taste, you want it more. I, I wanted to go back again, and it never happened. We never came as close as we did that night over in Paris. And little things did start to to change after that. Anyway, I, I always felt once Liam Brady left the coaching staff of, of Trapattoni, things started to fall apart a little bit. Although yes, the team did get to the Euros after it. There was there was things that were starting to develop. I'm not going to develop maybe the wrong word, but that that link, that communication link, had certainly gone from coaching staff or management. I felt to to the team, and that that was a big blow. Um, and yeah, I'd probably agree with that as well. Two years older, the the, the side aren't as as dynamic. They aren't as, as strong. They aren't as powerful. And maybe that was two years two years later that two years in the legs, I suppose. Mm. That, that maybe cost that team, yeah. And I think that it would have been a lot better for us playing in that World Cup. Yeah, I think we would have certainly give a, a better account of ourselves at that major tournament, yeah. Nathan asked uh, Shea if he'd used the word cheating. Shea was saying, oh, look, maybe cheating's a bit harsh, whatever. No, nah, cheat, cheat, cheat was but, definitely used in the dressing room many, it? many times. Was it? Okay. 100%. It, yeah. was, it was used every, on every turn, yeah. I don't know if you've met him since. If you bumped into Henri now and you had 15 minutes in a room together chatting, 
Would you say, would you, you know, you've talked there, I wasn't not too impressed with his celebration and, you know, you can't have it both ways, Mr. Nice Guy, and acting the way you did. What would you say to him? Like, would you, kind of, would you let him know what you thought or is it all fair in love and war? I met him, actually. I met him in, I, in London. Um, it was probably about six years, seven years ago, the first time I'd seen him since. It might be a bit more than that, actually. It's probably mm. going back about eight years, two, two or three years anyway afterwards. And... He was he was a little bit sheepish when he met me. He just he basically just came over, said hi, and he he, he kind of you know when you have that conversation with someone and they hang around a little bit uncomfortably. It was a bit like that. He wanted to say something, but it was maybe the unspoken between us, and that was it. We just kind of just I just said all the best, and I think he was actually playing at the MLS at the time, so I think it was in the close season. So he was back over in the UK, and I met him in London, mm. and then I met him when we were doing BBC stuff in. Was it uh, Brazil? I think it was Brazil when he was doing stuff for BBC or maybe even the Euros 2016. So I was doing BBC stuff over there. And um, we, although we never worked in the studio together, we, we we chatted a few times. And in fairness, he never brought it up once. I, and I had no desire to bring it up to him. I would have expected, I would, probably would have expected him to say something, yeah, mm. but we didn't speak at length. You know, we, we wouldn't be friends. I don't really know him. So that was, that, that was it, really. We just kind of... I don't know, maybe the unspoken was always there between us. Mm. i got to say I was surprised by how big it became so quickly. Obviously, we were in Paris. I remember getting a call the following morning to go on with Ian Dempsey, to go on with Ray Darcy. Oh, and the big time. The, the big time. You know, <laughs> and I was trying to explain that I'd gone out to drown my sorrows and maybe I couldn't take this call right now, but they were trying to express this. Please, Listen, please, this is big. Please, you said, this what? This is big. What time I'm available? I love it. Just think of the egos in that studio there now as well. You know, one and two, you know, that's, that's what they're looking at there, number one and two. So that, this is it. This wow. is the big time now, Nate. Don't worry about that, pal. But I, I'd say I must have been on with Ray Darcy, he said, about quarter to ten. Yeah. And listening into the first 45 minutes. And it was nothing but. Oh, yeah. Nothing but. And that continued, obviously, for 48 hours. And... I don't know, maybe we're immune to it from covering so many matches. I just sort of thought this was another sporting injustice and everybody just shrugs, goes, it's an outrage, he's a disgrace, yeah. but we move on with our lives. But for some reason, this just took on a, a whole other life. I guess it was just the stakes, wasn't it? And it was so blatant mm. and it was the stakes. I mean, uh, that's end of the road, game over. It's come back again. Kev, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well done, Joel. Well done, Nate. Cheers, Goodman. lads. Thanks, Kev. That's Kevin Goodman. Uh, you mentioned there the sense of what was going on the next day. I ha we had a five-minute... We won't play it now because we don't have time, and I want to get to some other stuff. We had five minutes of Tom Dunn going through the papers the next morning and the LA Times and what they were saying in Beijing and the global sense of the story. So uh, Ray Darcy... Jeez, they had Murphy, they had Darcy. What a time. Uh, Ray Darcy was in Today FM, decided to ring the FIFA press office. This was the kind of stuff that was going on the next day. <laughs> Uh, it's a really difficult question, and I, uh, I, I know uh, obviously where you're coming from. But uh, literally, since uh, since uh, I got into the office this morning, I've been sort of taking uh, quite a number of calls on this, and uh, at the moment, just trying to sort of work through uh, work through what people are asking of us. So, the mm. uh, best thing I could probably ask you at the moment, and again, I know it doesn't answer the questions uh, uh, immediately, but if you can just uh... is there any precedent, Alex, for um, you know playing a match again? No, I mean, I just, no I'm, just, I'm, sat, I'm just sat here now with the laws of the game in front of me uh, uh, in, in relation to the decisions of the referee. And it says the decisions of the referee regarding facts connected with play, including whether or not a goal is scored and the result of the match of final, the referee may only change a decision on realising that it is incorrect or at its discretion on the advice of an assistant referee or the fourth official provided that he has not restarted play or terminated the match. OK, right. So it would have had the, to... Somebody would have had... The laws of the game. Yes, so somebody would have had it to alerted him to what happened there and then, which Irish yeah. players attempted to do, but that's that's what happens in everything. So um, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, again, uh, I did think you see the, the match the, last night, Alex? Did yeah, I was watching. I was watching right. at home. Yeah. Uh, how I did mean, you feel? You're, you're English, obviously. I'm, I'm assuming you're English, right? Uh, I am. Yes. yes yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, again, I think uh, we're we're wary that um, you know the, the, the issues like this, uh, you know, uh, or, or maybe not in exactly the same way, but they're you know they're they're they're, they're happening. Poor Alex. Please, Mr. Darcy, it's my first day at work. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I just picked up the phone. <laughs> yeah. Poor Alex. Am I on the radio? Yes, yes you are. Yeah, live. In Ireland. Live. <laughs> so he couldn't say very much, but one man who could, Nathan. His time had come. The FAI were quick to uh, react to the game. They issued a request to FIFA for the game to be replayed. John Delaney explaining the reasons why. All we can do is what we did today. It's up to others to determine that. 
I mean, we weren't going to take this sitting down and just say, oh, listen, that's football and good luck to it. Um, we've written to FIFA, written to the French FA today and looked for a replay. And I think given the enormity of last night's match, the whole world we're watching, the integrity of our sport has been questioned hugely. When a player can admit that he handles the ball, when there are four offences around that goal, two offsides and two handballs, it really brings into question the integrity of our sport on a world basis. Our players don't get much money for playing for their country. Playing at club level, they're, they're played enormous money, but not for their country. And I think we had to do what we did today um, because I do genuinely believe, given the emails and text messages we've had from all over the world, from clubs and different national associations, that the integrity of our sport is questioned. Those young kids, 7, 8, 9, 10 years of age, see the events of last night, and their impression will be that Ireland were robbed of their rightful place to go to the World Cup. That the best team should go to the World Cup. The best team should go. And if France were to accede to a replay and they beat us, that's fair and square, and they go to the World Cup as the best team. But there's no doubt in anybody who understands the game that last night the best team did not qualify for the World Cup. Now, words are fine, but deeds are more important. We've done what we've done today because it's for the players, it's for the management staff, it's for the Irish supporters who were magnificent last night. But it's also for the integrity of our sport, and I genuinely mean that. Well, look, integrity is very important. Wow. There are so many lines out of that that you could now take in a different context. The punches kept on coming. Lunchtime live. They had to go to the main man. Who can tell? Um, he's got uh, his reputation to salvage at the moment. Um, and um, his commercial endorsements for Gillette and uh, I think Renault among them. Um, so he'd be worried about that. I think probably on reflection, he feels bad about it. Um, you know, it was, it was. Uh, there's a lot of cheating in soccer, um, but this was a particularly egregious sort of act, uh, which I'm sure he regretted afterwards. And um, on Saturday, when he came on to play for Barcelona, he came on as a sub. He was booed by the Bilbao supporters, so he's going to um, carry the sort of the, the taint of it for a while, and he'd be considering that um, the, his retirement from international football. Well. With the present manager, France aren't going anywhere except to South Africa, but they're not going to do very well there. I wouldn't have thought, um, despite the talent in the in the squad. Uh, so um, it's been an unhappy affair for everybody, really, mm. and it's a it's a terrible indictment of FIFA, the the world's governing body, because it's their um, inadequacies that's exposed everyone to this mm. um, unhappy state of affairs. You know what? <laughs> Sweet edit. <laughs> <laughs> that was Eamon Keane at the very end there talking to Eamon Dunphy on Lunchtime Live I've got a brief selection for you we don't have time for all of these I have you can have Nathan Murphy you can have Barney Ronay giving his thoughts to Tom Dunn you can have Own Hand a minute of Own Hand talking about the need for technology I can have Graeme Hunter intriguingly it says here Henri was with Barcelona at the time Graeme Hunter on why it shouldn't have come as a surprise, what happened, which is... I could easy. never say no to a bit of Graham Hunter. OK. I also will put on the menu for you in a moment some John Giles, which, you know, is hard to refuse as well. So, uh, Graham Hunter, this was uh, Graham Hunter talking about Henri, who was with Barcelona at the time, and he said it shouldn't have come as a surprise. I think what he's shown is what we used to call previous, or in Scots law, mens rea. Um, it's deliberate. The action that he's taken, you can choose whether or not to forgive him for what was cheating or gamesmanship. And I'm interested to listen to some of your players, particularly Kevin Coban, shy away from cheating and kind of saying, it's totally the referee's fault, only the referee's fault. It can't be only the referee's fault. Because there's intent and, and there's a pattern, as you say, because in the 2006 European Cup final, he felt he was booted all over the place by both Rafa Marquez and Carlos Puyol. And he bitterly complained about this at the end of the match. We were 10 men, but we were, it was an offside goal, the first goal. I was fouled. Marquez should have been sent off. Pools should have been sent off. And he took that niggle with him to the World Cup in 2006, felt he'd been fouled a couple of times, said to the referee in the game against Spain, um, why are you not protecting me? This is the second time this happened between me and Puyol. Pernea, the fullback, the Argentinian fullback for, who'd been naturalised for Spain, was going to get to a ball first. Henri admits openly in, an, in two or three interviews, although he didn't admit it after that game in the World Cup, I saw that Puyol was coming near me. So I went down as if he'd made contact with me. And I, you know, I got, I got the foul and we scored from the... Uh, Puyol was sent off. We scored from the free kick. The France won that game thanks to what was a, a absolute best gamesmanship. And I, and I think that you're right... This 
this shows an intent to use the situation. What would make me even angrier than I am right now in the name of sport, if I was Irish, I'd be angry with the second handball, the second touch. First touch, maybe. Maybe it came so fast that we can't tell whether it was involuntary or not. The second one, as Ken said, was to bounce it and knock it off his head and put it in the net. The second one was definitely deliberate, and there is a pattern, as you say, Ken. Previous. I mean, the second handball, it was very skillful. Mm. Two touch. The first one, as Graham says, you often do see where it's, you're just trying to keep it in play and it's mm. half arm, half chest, but the second one was... Even the ingenuity. <laughs> even when he was cheating, it was impressive. Mm. Own hand here, I'm being told, own hand is worth the listen. So he was calling on FIFA to use this incident to bring in video technology. So here's own hand. I mean... That's, that's exactly the point I'm making. Here is the situation where we can use this instance. They can use this instance to say, hey, this World Cup is one that we want to set the example with. They keep on saying for previous World Cups and it's only got worse. Mm. So, okay, use this instance because it is the, the, the stature of a player like Henri to say, hey, look, we take, if it, you know, co covert cheating. Covert cheating is drug taking in sport. What's it done for? To achieve success. This is overt cheating. And how would they know it happened? So what are they doing about it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And okay, help those referees to make the correct decisions that everybody can see that justice perceived and fair play is perceived to be done properly. The whole day, everybody that's watching the game all over the world, and particularly those kids. I mean, the money that comes into the game is through global satellite TV, and they, they, they can't see past their nose. There's the millions of kids that are watching it that are learning all the wrong things. The culture of cheating is one that you succeed by. That's anger. That's next day territory, I think. You know, it's funny, everybody, well, not everybody, but we often point to the Lampard goal over the line against Germany in the World Cup in 2010, so the following summer, as the moment where officials at FIFA and UEFA said, OK, maybe we do need to take this seriously. I presume the Henri Hambo will have to play a part in accelerating the move towards what we now love and know as VAR. <laughs> the clear and obvious error. Mm. Which, I mean, would come under that remat remit. Well, it, presumably though, with VAR right now. <laughs> mm. You would question it. Presumably, it would have been disallowed. Mm. Uh, final point. We'll give the final word to John Giles. This was uh, a week on. Things had died down. John Giles in to uh, put this thing to bed so that we wouldn't be talking about it 10 years later. I mean, I, I, do, I personally could cries out for technology. You know, they're talking about putting maybe extra referees are behind the goals and yeah. all that. I mean, I, I, I did, we'll use both. You know, I think we should use whatever we have at our disposal. Uh, to, to put it right yeah. see I think what's happened with the game like I, I think I said before to you, on it, you know, referees are, are a protected species and what they're saying now is look we, we can't even fee for saying we can look at the evidence and see what happened but unless the French so, uh, Federation say we agreed to a second game we can't do anything about it mm. in other words the referee was there he didn't see it so we have to back the referee. So it's all about backing the referee. So I think what's happened in the game is that, you know, I think the game has fallen behind uh, behind the times in relation to the sports because what's happened now, as we know, like in my time, only the odd match was televised. So referees made mistakes in my day, but nobody could see them. They were never exposed for making the mistakes in the way that they are today. Right? So yeah. the technology has exposed the referees' mistakes more than ever. But we haven't used my technology to improve the decisions that the referees have made. So it's a double whammy for the referees, you know. We, we, should, we should definitely be using technology now, anything we have at our disposal, to get the correct uh, decision. Yeah. That's, all we, that's all we want. And if the referees made a mistake, like the lad said, like the referee did last week, he'd be the first to say, now, I made a mistake. How would, the, uh, how would you work that? Would it be a case, because the fear is people say that the game would become too stop-start if you're checking too many decisions. Do you just give somebody, do you just give each team one challenge per match or something like that? Or? Well, I think the details could be worked out. I think it has to be agreed in principle that technology is going to, is going to play a part. Yeah. And what you'll find is that people say, well, what if this and what if that? You know, well, you have to eliminate as much as you possibly can of, uh, you know, uh, very, very doubtful decisions. You certainly don't want to stop start the game. But there are certainly issues like the thing that happened the other night, for example, that we could have corrected in 15 seconds. So let's work on what we can actually do mm. rather than saying, well, if this goal was scored or that goal was scored, we can, those things can be worked out as you go along. It might never be ideal. It might never be perfect. But certainly in situations like what happened the other night it could be better and, and it can be improved and there'll be trial, a lot of trial and error in it uh, on sure but we get there you know and certainly the, the most obvious ones 
we could correct. Yeah. So it's no good saying, well, if that happens and that happens, and the obvious, correct, the obvious things are still going on, you know, whether it be a penalty decision, whether it's indicted by the balls over the line, things. there's certain things we could do now. And if they want to have referees behind the goal, well, no harm with that, as long as it, it, we get to the right decisions on the, on the pitch. Well, remember this the next time we're criticising VAR. That's John Giles talking to Owen McDevitt a week on from you know what. So, Nathan Murphy, I mean, this is sad. A World Cup was um, plucked away from us. Mm. Final thoughts on it all? Ten years on? I can't believe we're doing this ten years on. (laughs) It is that. It's the missed opportunity. France went there. It was an absolute mess. Mm. They embarrassed themselves throughout the entire thing. That was a very good, strong Irish squad that, as Kevin touched on, believed still in Giovanni Trapattoni, yeah. even if they did sort of flip the script that night. They would have gone, they would have been frustrating, they would have been difficult to play against. Mm. They probably would have been the team that is a neutral you wouldn't have wanted to have watched. But we've seen from Robbie Brady and Lille since then, Irish football is about these one moments. Mm. And one goal, one winner at a World Cup finals justifies everything. It does, yeah. yeah. And that was taken away by what was blatant cheating. <laughs> I don't hold it against them, yeah. but... I don't either. But it was so blatant. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Ten years on. <clears throat> we promise not to revisit this in another ten years. I'm losing my voice. I'm so upset. Uh, that was our look back. should point out we did offer Thierry Henry the opportunity to come on and defend himself. Did we really? I did. I, I emailed the relevant people. And did the relevant people respond? Certainly not. <laughs> but they would, I mean, he would have loved the opportunity. He would just, have. He didn't he receive have. the message. So um, I presume he was forced into doing this, as happened on occasion, uh, but the great Ken Early was forced, I think we can safely say, to uh, soothe the nation with his dulcet tones, and he sang out the show that evening. So we'll leave the final word to him. That's a look I was petrified Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side But I spent so many nights thinking how you did me wrong And I grew strong And I learned how to carry on And so you're back from outer space I just walked in to find you here With that sad look upon your face I should have changed my stupid luck I should have made you leave the key If I would known for just one second You'd be back to bother me Go on now, go Walk out the door Just uh-huh. turn around now Cause you're not welcome anymore Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me with goodbye You think I'd crumble? Gotta go, Katie. We're finished, are we? Yeah.